As you know, the uh, messages I've been preaching lately have been prophetic. Uh, we have been distributing all over the United States a book called America's Last Call on the Break of, of the Financial Holocaust. When I started writing that book, the stock market was 9,000, and nobody thought it would ever end. You were warned here. You were warned here. It's already fallen 10%, and we'll probably take another hit. It may stabilize, but we are headed for some very, very troubled times. And uh, a quarter million of those books have gone out just to our mailing list alone. And uh, the letters that come back, my wife is here with me, and she can vouch for what I'm about to tell you, that thousands and thousands of letters from all over the United States, uh, Christians that are afraid, Christians that say, we just don't know what to do, and there's panic, and there's fear. And I was reading what one of the Puritan uh, theologians said, if God speaks to you to warn the people of coming events, you have got to believe him to give you a message of hope along with it. And I, I am nearly finished, probably. Maybe This message will go in the book, and I think there are three more after that. And the book will be finished. It's, it's going to be probably released the 1st of December, and it's going to be how God intends to care for his people during the coming worldwide depression. And it's a book of hope. And I hope my message this morning... Uh, this afternoon is a message of hope for you. I'm not trying to write a book. I promised God I would never write a book just to write a book. I think I've written 37. I, I would never write a book just for money. This past book uh, <clears throat> has uh, been highly blessed, but my wife and I haven't taken a single dollar from it. I'm not boasting on that. I'm just telling you that uh, the Lord told us to give them free to to the poor and to widows and to the unemployed. I think 30,000 have been given away free. And God has honored that. And we've, we've had, as a result of that, we've had people write and say, uh, how much did it cost to print 100,000 or 150,000 books? And I would say, well, 45,000. And so we're sending you a check for the 45,000 to pay for it. and and. The reason they did so is that most of the ministries who write to us are begging, but we've never seen a minister who gives stuff away. And so that was a real heartwarming experience for us. This afternoon, my message, the Antichrist, Armageddon, and the Mark of the Beast. Now that's a big, big subject. <laughs> I hope before I'm finished... You will never again in your lifetime worry or fret about the Antichrist, Armageddon, or the mark of the beast. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your precious word. I thank you for your anointing. Lord, you've called me to be one of your many, many watchmen to the nation. And now, Lord, here's a message we're going to send around the world because people in Indonesia... People all over the world, in Thailand, in Japan, Christians in Korea, Afghanistan, Pakistan, wherever the shaking is, and in the Balkans, Lord, you have a remnant, a holy people. And Lord, you're going to send a gracious word, a word of hope, a word of, of, of uh, encouragement to your church. And let this be one of those words that go forth from this crossroads of the world today, we pray. Hide me, Jesus. Let your word come forth. Let us receive it. I thank you for the one. I didn't get this from a book. I got it from your heart. You put this on my heart. I got it from you, and I give it as such in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the more perilous times become, the more interested people become in pr prophetic events. And the more these things happen, the more prophetic books, the more conferences on prophecy you're going to see and hear about. And right now when I speak to you, the presses around the world, the Christian presses are, are just 
grinding out one book after another on prophetic events about the Antichrist, Armageddon, the beast, the mark of the beast, and so forth. In fact, I sent my secretary down this week to the Christian bookstore here on 43rd Street, and I, I said, Barbara, pick up, uh, uh, try to find a book on the mark of the beast. She brought back a stack of books, and I started reading these books, and some of the authors called themselves the nation's foremost authority on Bible prophecy. I can't imagine anybody suggesting that of themselves or even allowing someone else to say that about them. Uh, one of the books is called uh, The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. And in this book, the author, Englishman, suggests that Prince Charles is a part of the Antichrist system. In fact, that on his uh, coat of arms is the mark of the beast, the, the insignia of the beast, and that Prince Charles's bank is going to be the initiator of the mark of the beast. Quite uh, an ingenious approach, I must say. But few, uh, I, I started glancing through these books uh, of these prophecy experts, and no two agreed. Some are pre-trib, some are mid-trib, some are post-trib. And there was some believe that Jesus is coming before the Great Tribulation and we're going to escape all the suffering. Some believe we're going to go through three and a half years of what is called the seven-year Great Tribulation or Jacob's Trouble. And then at three and a half years, I don't know the scripture on that, but the, the, the Jesus is going to come then. Others that we're going to go through all of this, and uh, including the mark of the beast and everything, and at the end of all times, Jesus will come. And in fact, some people that write to me now are very insistent, Pastor David, you've got to tell us whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. And, and, and one or a few said, if you are not pre-trib, we do not want to receive any more of your mail. We can't accept any words you say. They are so locked into a position on all prophetic events that, that you can't talk to them. Now, let me tell you what I believe. Listen closely before I go any further. I believe that Jesus Christ can come at any moment. I believe he can come in a twinkling of an eye. Now, listen very closely. He can come at any moment in a twinkling of an eye, he says... I believe that we're to be ready and expecting him. He said he's coming for those who look for him. I have expected his coming ever since I was a child and knew anything about it. When I, I've told you that every time I heard a trumpet, I stood at attention because I thought that was it. The Bible said he's coming when we least expect him. I don't think anything else has to be fulfilled. He can come, he can come today. He can come anytime. But the saints will not be caught unaware because they're to be ready at any time. But I also believe that Christians are going to endure a great amount of suffering before even Jacob's struggle or the tribulation. There could be a series of years of worldwide depression and great suffering. We don't know when the tribulation period will begin. In fact, we, we know very, very little about these things because many of these things have been hidden by the scripture. <clears throat> in Afghanistan, in certain African nations, in Iran or Iraq, Christians right now are being mutilated. They're being beheaded. They are being cast out of their homes. They can't get a job. Their, their children are being taken from them. And you ask them about the great tribulation, they'll tell you they're in it. They are in it. Same in Indonesia, when Suharta resigned, you remember the riots that broke out and the ethnic Chinese that were killed and what very few people realized, the majority of them were overcoming Christians. And they lost their homes, they lost their lives, their businesses were looted. And you tell those people, well, I'm going to be taken out of this. Jesus is going to come and deliver us. It didn't happen. There was, there was great suffering. The Indonesians right now are eating one meal a day. The Christians, very scarce, one meal a day. And a year ago, they were living in great prosperity. There are people, young people that come to me after services from this church, from various nations. We have over 103 nationalities at last count. And there are young people that come to me and say, I don't even know if my dad and mom are living. They're in some of these countries where there are tribal uprising, uprisings. 
and, and machete carrying rebels all over the nation and refugees running in all directions and among of them many, many Christians, homeless, hungry. Now, God is meeting many of these. And, and folks, if you went to Indonesia today, if you went to some of these countries, even though there is bloodshed and Christians are paying with their life, you will find one story after another. It'd be another book of Acts. You would hear of deliverances that were incredible. <clears throat> How God is providing food and shelter and everything else. And yet there is suffering. <clears throat> Even while I speak now, there are multitudes of God's saints around the world to whom the Antichrist, Armageddon, and the mark of beast don't mean anything at all. You go to Afghanistan and you, you try to talk to some of those underground Christians about the Antichrist, and they'll tell you that the Antichrist spirit right now is in control in their country and that they are, un they are fighting and resisting Antichrist right now. You go to other countries and, and you can talk about a beast, you say, and they'll tell you we have a beast in our government right now, a beast who's out to destroy every Christian in the nation. You talk about a future battle of Armageddon and they'll tell you a battle of Armageddon. We're trying to have, we have a war here just to survive day by day. You talk about the mark of the beast to many Christians right now, they say, what does that mean to us? We don't have anything to buy or sell. There's nothing to buy or sell. Now, I'm not ridiculing prophecy specialists or prophetic, prof, prophetic conferences because God has promised not to leave his people in the dark. He said he does nothing except to reveal it to his prophets. But I believe there's a great grief in the heart of God when his people look so intensely into the future they refuse to look at the present condition of their own hearts. They're so set on the future, so desirous to accumulate prophetic knowledge about future events that they can just drift away from the intimacy of Jesus Christ and sit in front of a television set like a, a couch potato talking about Armageddon. Folks, even the secular world is getting into the prophetic chic. Movies on Armageddon. Hollywood is trying to capitalize on this, this focus on biblical prophetic events. Too many Christians are talking about a coming devil incarnated man of sin. And they're not dealing with the sin of their own hearts. Now, do I believe that there's going to be a devil possessed man who comes to power in God's set time called an antichrist? Yes, I do. There will be a man who uh, totally represents the antichrist spirit and accumulated year after year accumulation of this spirit until it, uh, there's an apex till there's a period of time where this spills over and the devil himself incarnates a man called the man of sin. I believe that. But I also believe that that anti-Christian spirit, or the Antichrist himself, is no concern of mine, is no concern of any Christian here, because you and I will not be here when the Antichrist comes to power. I believe that with everything in my being. We will not be here. But having said that, I want you to know the Antichrist is here now. The Antichrist spirit, it's very clear in the scripture. If you would, I, there's no way you can convince me that Jesus Christ, who's kept his church for 2,000 years, and just prior to his coming, he's going to expose his church to the devil's right-hand man, to his Christ, to molest the church prior to going to her wedding feast. That's incredible to even contempt, uh, uh, to contemplate that the Lord Jesus would allow his bride to be placed into the filthy hands of a molester to try to turn his bride into a dysfunctional harlot just before he brings her into his wedding feast. Impossible. 
Furthermore, the scripture says the Antichrist spirit is at work ever since the cross. Listen to this in First John, little children. It's the last time. Folks, it was the last time when John wrote it. Can you imagine? This is the last of the last times. As you've heard that Antichrist shall come. I say even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it's the last time. And John tells us plainly to beware of the Antichrist among us right now. Not some future Antichrist, but the Antichrist right now. He said, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and this is the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist among us now, the Antichrist spirit are those who do not believe that Jesus Christ was God in flesh. They are those who teach even in our churches today. 40% of our denominational pastors don't even believe in the virgin birth. They do not believe that Christ was God. Antichrist is here at work now trying to tell you that you can honor Jesus as a good man, as a teacher, as a charitable man who would give his very life because he cared for people. Many, many books are written by that. And many Christians are buying this. Blasphemy. And even in the prosperity of the gospel, some have wondered why all my ministry, I have been standing up against the prosperity gospel. It's because they have been taking away the Godhood of Jesus Christ. That Christ went into, that we are all Christ. That Christ went and subjected himself to the devil. And had to fight his way through. That is blasphemy. This, this spirit is already in the land. It's in the world today, the spirit of Antichrist. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is Christ, is come in the, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Well, we heard that it should come, but even now is in the world. He said, you've heard of an Antichrist coming. He says, get your eyes off of that man. Look around you. The Antichrist spirit is all around you right now, trying to rob you of your confidence that Jesus Christ that you serve, to whom you've given your life, is God in the flesh. Because when you don't see him as God in the flesh, you have no protector, you have no God. The Antichrist spirit is not in the homosexual hangouts. It's not in the drunkard's bar room. It's not in the halls of Congress or education. It's in the backslidden, sin-condoning, perverse and excusing, lust-laden church. The backslidden church with its backslidden pastors are preaching Antichrist. Now do I also believe that there is a battle called Armageddon to be fought in the Mideast in a particular geographic location? Yes, I do. There's going to be a gathering of nations just as the Bible predicts. Revelation 16, 13 beginning to read. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They're the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth of the whole world and gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Folks, this is God's battle. It's not man's battle. It's God's battle. And he, God, by his spirit, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Folks, this last great battle between God and the nations of the world is not my concern. And it should not be your concern either. I am not going to be here when this battle fought. And furthermore, I'm not going to get upset by what, by nations that God said are nothing but dust that he's going to blow away. Let me read it to you. Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. They're counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted him less than nothing and vanity. Why should I fret about dust? 
that he's going to blow away with the breath of his mouth in an instant. And folks, why should I concern myself about a battle that's out in the future when I've got a battle in my own heart? Folks, the Armageddon's right here. The beast is right here. It's not out there. Everybody, the, 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 these books, whole books on the beast, from Prince Charles to whoever. The beast is right here. The old man, the sin nature. The real war is right here in my heart and in your heart. The Puritan theologians believed that Armageddon was a symbolic battle, a battle of the soul of the bride of Christ, that the devil was coming after the soul of the bride of Christ, and that was the great battle of Armageddon. And folks, I believe that over the past 2,000 years since the cross of Jesus Christ, there have been thousands of Christians who studied uh, Armageddon and they studied Antichrist, and they right, they they were absolutely consumed with these prophetic events. But they went to hell because they lost the battle of their own heart. What what good is it to study all your life and accumulate all this knowledge if you lose the battle right here? What sense is it? What is it? What, what if you can go from conference to conference and? I know preachers that read nothing but prophecy books, and I mean, they are experts. They can tell you every little detail. Of course, it's their, seen through their either the pre-trib or post-trib, whatever it is, they're, they're seeing through these eyes. But why teach it and preach it if you become a drifter away from the intimacy of Christ and you fall into the jaws of lust and you become cold and lukewarm and you die in apathy. What, what value is it? <clears throat> the Bible says, 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. You see, you've got a battle and it's a lust battle. And you people, we heard this morning from Pastor Carter about television. What, what, what about those movies you're renting? And you, you're feeding that. You're losing the war, folks. You've got Armageddon in your soul. Forget prophecy. Turn the knob. Or throw it out. Scripture said, thou shalt, not be a, thou shalt not bring an abomination into thy dwelling. Let's talk about the mark of the beast. Now, this is a prophetic event that's brought so much fear and confusion to the body of Christ. <clears throat> and now we're being inundated with all these ingenious, confusing explanations and speculations about what that mark is. Now, now, think about the horror of this whole thing, This, how horrible this whole event is. Not being able to buy or sell without a mark on your forehead or your hand. Not being able to function in any nation on earth. No food, no transportation, no way to make a living without the mark. And, and it conjures up among Christians... The, the, the fear that they're going to end up as beggars or living on miracles. And, and, and I believe God is going to create great miracles. He always has. But the, there's this fear, well, uh, if I'm going to have to take the mark of the beast, and, and nobody gets the mark of the beast unless they're worshiping the beast, unless they're worshiping the Antichrist. <clears throat> and we now we have there, there, there's one book that, that was given to me it's a book on instructions for the people left behind the whole book and and uh, I'm not making fun of that at all it's a very interesting book but that the, the book suggests that Christ comes 
before all this happens, and, and I believe he comes before the mark of the beast, but this particular book is saying, don't take it because there will be tribulation saints come out of this tribulation who, who refuse to worship the Antichrist system and the beast and refuse to take the mark and somehow they survive or they die or they starve or however it is and, and they have overcome. And the Bible does say, if any man worship the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall be, the same shall drink of the wrath of God. In Revelation 15, 2, there's a reference to those that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. They're standing in the sea of glass having the harps of God. Now, let, let, let me stop here and give you something out of my heart. I think it's absolutely unbecoming of Christians, and I think it's a uh, reproach to the house of God when, when Christians argue so much among themselves about the tribulation and about future events. Just absolutely argue and get set on something and say, this is the way it is, and that's it. Now, folks, you ask me, Brother Dave, are, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? You haven't told us yet. I am what I call we can't lose trib. <laughs> now, let me tell you why. There, th those that, that preach post-trib and, and some of these other things, they have many, many scriptures, many convincing scriptures, and they're godly people on all sides. But here's what, here's what I, I, I've come to. It doesn't matter to me, no matter what, God has given me a covenant promise that the Holy Ghost will never leave me as an orphan. He's going to go with me through fire, through flood, and through famine. He's going to sustain me even in the midst of depression and disaster. He said he would empower us to stand up against every, even the devil himself. If he can empower the Hebrew children to go through the fire furnace, if he can empower Daniel to go through the lion's den, he can empower us to, to refuse anything of the devil, to go through anything that the devil would try to throw against his bride, and in the process, go stronger. Now let me take you a little deeper now, please follow me. While so many Christians are focusing on Antichrist and Armageddon and the mark of the beast, a very more important prophetic event is taking place right now, and most of the prophecy preachers and writers and so forth don't even see it. There's, there's a more intense present, immediate, prophetic event before the tribulation, before the Antichrist, before the mark of the beast, before all of this. There is a very important prophetic event that's happening. Even as I speak to you right now, the whole world is falling into an economic depression. Japan is in depression. Indonesia, all the Asian tiger nations, nine of them are in depression. And now Russia, his government is about to collapse. Its economy has collapsed. All over the world, in Canada, the currency is falling. Australia, Philippines. This, this whole thing, and I want you to listen closely because I, you've got to see and hear this because the Lord made this so clear to me. This worldwide economic holocaust began just a year ago, July the 2nd, 1997. The whole world was in an economic euphoria. The whole world was in prosperity. People were saying, you know, the Asian tigers, they were, they had, they were talking about 50 years of prosperity. Japan was saying it, 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 it's, it's, uh, emperor's palace and grounds were worth more than all the real estate of California. Here in the United States, they were saying we are depression proof. The whole world was awash in euphoria. Economic euphoria. In Indonesia, they were running around in Mercedes. People were buying and selling. And, and young, they called them economic Turks, were, were just rolling in the money. And then in July 2nd, 1997, Thailand, 
stopped defending the bot, its currency, and it went into a free fall. Then on October 27th, the Hong Kong stock market began to sink. In fact, the Hong Kong market almost brought the world down into depression. All of the experts were waiting breathlessly, and it still may bring down all of the Asian economy further. On November 24th, Japan's fourth largest brokerage firm went bankrupt in that country. On December 18th, Korea elected a new president hoping to stop the slide in the depression, but it didn't work. May 21st, Saharta of Indonesia resigned after 32 years in power. The riots broke out, many were killed. Then June 19th, Russia begged the IMF to rescue their nation from collapse. Russia's central bank suspended all foreign currency trade. If you've seen the pictures this past week, they're all lined up at the bank. They can't get their money. The ruble collapsed. Russia is going into economic and social freefall. And here in the United States, August the 28th, the American stock exchange began to tremble and fail 10%, over a thousand points combined. And I want you to look at at the timeline, less than one year, a whole world goes from economic euphoria, the whole world begins to shake and tremble, and you remember what the words of Jesus said, I will shake everything that can be shaken. <laughs> Think of it now, in one year, from unprecedented optimism to utter chaos and fear and Currencies falling, governments in turmoil all over the world. Now Brazil is about to go down. All of Latin America, Venezuela is just holding on. All of South America and all Latin America is going to absolutely be in depression before another 12 months. But what does it mean? Why, what is God doing? Why is it so sudden? Is it that God has now decided to judge the world for its bloodshed, its iniquities, its godlessness? Yes, of course, the world is full of iniquity and its cup of iniquity is running over. We live in times that are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, worse than Noah's time. But folks, all of that is not the primary reason behind what you're seeing and hearing now. That's not the primary cause of the judgment. That's part of it. I've already told you also in a former message that, that God judges nations because he has a controversy concerning Zion. That any nation that touches his church and begins to abuse his people, he begins to judge. That's why in Pakistan and Afghanistan, those nations now are just holding on. They're about to go in total chaos in New York Times today, Pakistan. Read the story on Pakistan and Afghanistan. Why? Because the Muslims are killing Christians, putting swords through them, cutting off their heads and their arms, and destroying, trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. And God said, I have a controversy with any nation, any people who touch my bride. And here in America, we are being chastised now because we have people trying to make it politically correct to choke everything that has to do with the reality of Jesus Christ. Every kind of rule and legislation my goodness, now trying to get God off our coins, can't even hang a, a plaque on a wall uh, ha having nothing but a commandment on it. Bring condoms and everything in the school, but throw God out. You better believe he's got a controversy concerning Zion. You better believe it. And until America's leaders get its Hands off the choke hold on the church. We're going to keep being judged. But folks, listen to me, please. Yes, a worldwide chastening before wick for wickedness and violence. That's part of it. God's vengeance against nations that stand against his holy people. Yes, that's part of it. But God has shown me something. And I want you to listen close to this. You've not heard this before. 
Christ, here is the real bottom line, so to speak. Here is the real reason why suddenly all over the world we are sliding into depression and chaos. Christ is taking his chosen into a wilderness one last time as the last opportunity to find a people who will fully trust him as their Lord, Savior, and provider. Now follow me, please. What could be more clear than we are living in the last of the last days? But there is a glorious promise that God has in this book that still lays unclaimed. Many, many years ago, God took a chosen people into a wilderness. He chose these people. He took them in the wilderness and he took them there for one purpose. He was looking for a people who would fully trust him as provider. He took them out, stripped them of everything that human humankind could depend on for resources. Stripped all the resources. Put them in a wilderness where there was no food, there was no water, there was nothing to live on. They were stripping of their homes, their houses, their careers, their jobs, their incomes, everything. God says, I'm taking you into a wilderness. I'm going to strip you of every resource. I'm going to call you to my heart. I'm going to make you an everlasting promise that you can go through any trial without any visible means of support. And I will be your God. I'll be your resource. I'll be everything. It failed because of unbelief. After miracle of deliverance, after miracle of deliverance, after God providing food from heaven and ravens falling from the sky and providing water out of a rock every time another crisis came. Can God do this? Unbelief. So the promise was never accepted. It was still on the table. And even in David's time, even in David's time, there remained a rest, unclaimed. God has always been looking. Since Israel, he's, the reason he chose Israel is looking for a people who he could look on with rejoicing and say, he trusts me, she trusts me, I found somebody. I found somebody believes I'm God. I found somebody not living in fear. I found somebody not murmuring and complaining. I found somebody that believes I can be a provider. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Oh, God grieved for 40 years over these people. He had no other purpose than to try to train them in faith. He wanted to be such a glorious God of deliverance to these people. But I believe God grieves even greater over what he sees in his church today. Over his own beloved people. Even those who claim to be intimate and loving with him. We have so many people just like the disciples, we doubt him even when he's in the boat. I can only surmise what the Lord sees when he looks on his church today. What does he see? I'm afraid he sees a people, a multitude of people who worship, praise him, magnify his name, but go home and fret and worry about maintaining a prosperous lifestyle. A people growing indifferent and apathetic, wrapped up in so many activities that they have no time to seek the face of God anymore. And furthermore, and probably worse of all, a people crying and praying for revival for no other reason but to appease God to keep up our lifestyle. How many are praying, revival, Lord, send revival. That's so that an angry God would be appeased and I don't have to let go of my things. Christians scrambling to find 
money and resources to survive. Worrying about Social Security and retirement. Worrying about their mortgages and their investments and full of anxiety and fear. As if our security depended on our wit and our wisdom. Listen to me, please. The most present prophetic event in God's calendar, the next thing on the calendar, is a worldwide depression. This is the next thing, and in it, and the cause of it, and the reason God's doing it now and quickly, because I believe His coming is so soon, and He is going to take His bride into the wilderness, and once again strip the church of Jesus Christ of all of its human resources, Back again into the wilderness of depravity. I'm not saying that, he, that you're going to be a beggar. I'm not saying anything. You and I, are every we, we are going to wake up one day in a different world soon. And it's not going to be like it's ever been before. It will never come back to what it was and is now. It's going to be a changed world. Folks, listen to me closely. He is bringing his people into a last day wilderness experience. He started his church that way. He's going to end it that way. It started in the wilderness. It's going to end in the wilderness. This generation has never had to trust God. Have your children ever had to trust God? You've supplied everything your kids have. They want sneakers. They don't want $30 sneakers. They want $150 sneakers. Here, honey, MasterCard, go get it. Anything we want, get it. You know we don't even have repairmen left in America because anything breaks down, we throw it away and buy it new. It's all going to change. It's all going to change. This generation has not had to pray for daily food. We've lived in such abundance. But soon, very, very soon, you and our children, you and I and our children are going to have, we're going to be thrust into to this new world, deprived of all of the abundance we now have. And folks, it's not because God's angry with this bride, not at all. He said, I'm doing this to woo her back to me. He does it out of love. Why don't you go to Hosea and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm not even going to ask if this makes sense to you because the Lord just told me to preach it. And I'm, I'm not going to ask whether you're with me or not. I, I'm going to just keep going ahead here now. And Hosea 2, second chapter. Verse, beginning is verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her pass. She shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them and shall not find them. And she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband for then was it better with me than now. Verse 9. Therefore will I return. I'm going to take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover naked. You know what that means? It, it, look at me, please. Ho Hosea is coming to a church that's backslidden. The people that have turned to iniquity transgress. The pastors are in, in, into iniquity and leading them astray. And he said, now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to send a, a depression on you. I'm going to take away the wine. I'm taking away the grain. And what he's talking, I'm taking away your economic blessing. I'm going to take it all away. And that's what's happening right here in verse 10. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. None shall deliver out of my hand. I will cause all her mirth to cease her feast days, her new moons and Sabbath, and all her solemn feasts. You know what he's saying? The party's over, folks. The party's over. All the drunkenness and the drugs and everything else, it's all over.
God said, I'm going to remove, in verse 13, even the wealth. You, you, you'll see it. And I'll, I will visit upon her days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them and decked herself with her earrings and her, her jewels. All the jewels, all the wealth. It's talking about the good times and the wealth. It's all over. Now, folks, follow me, please. God, in his love, is going to bring a people back to their spiritual senses, back to their first love, in a wilderness of scarcity. Look at me, with me, please, at verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her where? And bring her into the wilderness. He's speaking about his church, Zion. And speak comfortably unto her. I'm going to take her into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and in the days when she shall come up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shall not call me any more Bailey. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven with the creeping things of the ground. I'll break the bow and the sword and the battle of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Now listen to me, folks. Look this way, if you will, again, please. In this economic collapse that's coming, in this time, God says, I'm going to bring you away from all of these things that have taken your heart. Can you, can you imagine a time when you won't be able, no Christian will be able to afford monthly payments on internet? There goes the internet sex. There goes the hours wasted watching knowledge of nonsense. You can't go to the movies anymore. You don't have money for frivolous things. And, and, and suddenly, meeting with the bridehood, going to church becomes the highlight of your life, being a part of the body of Christ. And now you have time to pray. And the reason you have time to pray because you're praying in your daily necessities. That's what happened in the wilderness. God said, I'm going to allure you. But he says, I'm going to teach you to praise me and love me like you've never praised me and loved me before because I'm going to give you the true vineyards. And the valley of Acre is going to be a door of hope. You're going to sing that. Our hope is there. If a revival comes to the church, it's coming in the wilderness, in a valley of scarcity. When people are driven to their knees. You're not going to be talking to your psychiatrist about your hang-ups anymore. You're not even going to talk about how you were abused 40 years ago. You're going to be on your knees. Oh God, I believe you for next day's meals. Look at verse 19. And in the wilderness, he's talking about him. There I will what? Betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. You'll know him as you've never known him before. He said, there was a time you loved me with all your heart. There was a time you treated me like a bridegroom should be treated. There were no other lovers. You were faithful to me. He said, I'm going to take away all of your other loves. I'm going to isolate you all to myself. He said, there I'm going to reveal my love to you. And I'm going to get back the tenderness from you that I've longed for. And he said, you and I are going to get to know each other again before I come. You're going to know who I am. He's going to woo us. 
in the wilderness. Now, I, I can prove this even further. But I'm going to close in just five minutes, but I want you to go to Jeremiah 2, please. Jeremiah 2. <clears throat> Oh, God, I thank you for your word. You said you'd not leave us to our own devices. Hallelujah. Folks, just, let's just thank him for his word. Lord, I thank you for the truth that sets us free. We humble ourselves to hear your word. Lord, we humble ourselves to hear your word. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Jeremiah 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espouses, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Look at me, please. He's talking to a people who are backslidden. And he's come to, he says, and God's speaking through Jeremiah. He said, I remember what it was like when you had nothing. When you weren't wallowing in prosperity, how you went after me. And he said, I took you into wilderness. It was not sown. You know what he's saying, not sown? There was no grass. There was no grain. There was nothing anywhere. It was not sown. It was a dry, empty place. And yet, you loved me at that time with tenderness. You had a heart for me. And you went after me. I was the goal of your life. I was everything to you. Everything. In a barren, barren wilderness, not sown. You had become my bride. You loved me tenderly. You pursued my heart. And it was a place of total scarcity and barrenness. You had no human resources, but you didn't care because you were in love with me. Verse 8. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that are not right. And folks, this is exactly what's happened to our generation. Prosperity has robbed us of our passionate love for Jesus. It has destroyed many pastors. It's made a mockery of holiness. God's blessings have been taken for granted. Every man is out for himself. And the nominal church, including the nominal pastors of the denominations, many become lazy and corrupt and blasphemous against God. But Jeremiah, verse 10, tells us what God's going to do. Verse 9, rather. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. I'll pass over the isles of Chittim and Sea and send unto Kedar. <coughs> Folks, look at me, please. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, both you, both your children and your children's children will I plead. Here's what the prophet is saying. Look at me, please, because I'm wrapping this up now. He said, I'm, I pleaded. Verse 2, he said, I pleaded with you in the wilderness. It's where you started. And he said, once again, I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to take you in the wilderness. I'm going to plead with you. He said, I'm going to take you to myself, and I'm going to plead my marriage vows to you. I'm going to plead once again, be mine, be faithful to me. And he said, not only going to plead with you, but your children and your children's children. That's you, and that's me, that's today. And this is exactly why we're going into a worldwide depression. He's taking his church into a wilderness. Many are going to get bitter because they're, they're going to turn 
and say, God, you failed me. There's going to be absolute bitterness and hardness among many, many Christians, and they're going to lose everything in the wilderness. They're not going to get into the promised land. There's many of Israel never did get out of the wilderness in the past. And they're going to be that way. God says, I'm going to plead with you once again. I'm going to take you to that wilderness. Now, folks, let me give you a real good, encouraging word to close. I want you to stand and turn to Isaiah 35, please. Isaiah 35. You know, we always close with the hope. You can read while you're standing. I'm doing it. Let's start verse 1. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Folks, before I start, we start reading this, you know what the Holy Ghost is trying to do? He's, he is trying, and, and I'm hoping the book that God's put in my heart will, will just absolutely smash the fear. Drive it out of your heart. Absolutely drive it out of your heart because... The Lord said you're going to the wilderness, but, but that's going to be where he reveals himself to us. That's where the fellowship is going to be. That's where the miracles are going to be. This is where the grace. And, and he said, that's where you're going to sing. You think you're singing now. Wait. He said, you're going to sing in the wilderness. All right, here we go. I'm going to read all the way down. Let's read the whole chapter. All ten verses. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Where? In the solitary wilderness. Strengthen the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. The parched grass shall become a pool, the thirsty and springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass and reeds and rushes, and in a highway shall be there, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The way for a man, the fool shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, no ravenous beast shall go therein. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The ransom of the Lord shall return, come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall tame joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away in the wilderness. Raise your hands and thank God for the wilderness. Lord, I thank you for the wilderness. We shall not be afraid. Lift up your hands, you said. Be strong and fear not. Fear not. Fear not. We fear not. Hallelujah. God, remove all fear from your overcoming church. Lord, there ought to be a lot of fear in the sinner, the backslider, a lot of fear because things are going to get so panic. There's going to be such panic. The Bible said their hearts will fail them for fear. Many will die of heart attacks. But, oh God, you're going to have a church here in Times Square. They're going to shout. Without fear. Now, I'll tell you what, folks. The Holy Spirit told me, to, I just want to stop the service a minute. I have to give an invitation. I've got to give an altar call. It just now spoke to my heart. There, there are people here, listen to me now, that need to get out of your seat and walk down here now. Because you have lost your peace with God. Now, I'll tell you what. There are many, many reasons why we lose, lose our peace. 
And much of it is because we drift. We take the things of God for granted. And we have not given him everything in our hearts. We hold back something from him. And I don't know whether it's sin. I don't know whether it's a marriage problem. I don't know what it is. It's robbed you of your peace with God. And it's a terrible thing to stand in the presence of God or to go to the job or go to your home and not have absolute peace with God. I want you, I know God told this to me. I know this is what he told me to tell you. If you're standing here without, to if, if the message I preached didn't bring, absolutely bring you to rest, absolute peace flood your soul, I want you to get out of your seat. Some of you here have been slipping away from your first love. You don't have that red hot fiery love you once had. And many of you here that are just not right. Things are not right. But especially if you've lost that peace. You say, Brother Dave, I don't want to leave here without the peace of God in my soul. I want you to get out of your seat. The balcony, go to the stairs on either side, come down any aisle. If you're downstairs or you're watching on closed circuit, I want you to come into the main auditorium and down to the front here and let me pray with you right now. We're not trying to build up a number here. The Lord knows what he's after. The Lord knows what he wants to do here. Hallelujah. Folks, I thank God. How many are glad you have the peace of God that passeth all understanding? Isn't it wonderful? Folks, don't be ashamed to come. There are many people that are coming. The Lord loves you. He wants you to be filled with his peace. He doesn't want you to go around with this fear hanging over you, this anxiety, this terrible, depressive thing that comes upon you. God wants you to be free from all that. Move in close, please. Make room for those that are coming. This is the conclusion of the message. Good things that keep people out of heaven. Good things that keep people out of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your manifest presence here this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you for manifesting Christ into our hearts and our minds. We thank you, Lord. This has been a good week because of your presence. Lord, it's always good when you are with us. You said you'd never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Now, Lord, I've got a serious uh, word to bring forth this morning, a very serious word. Lord, there are many people here, uh, there, there are so many here, that unless they hear this, will not even be saved. Oh, God, stir us by your Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, come down now. Take the word that you planted in my heart and let it find root. Let it find fruit in the hearts and lives of these who hear it. Father, anoint me, sanctify me. Give me clean hands and a pure heart that I may... Preach your word, O oh God, with nothing hindering. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good things that keep people out of heaven. Now, believe it or not, there are many people engrossed in doing wonderful good things who are not going to make heaven. Worse yet, there are many who consider themselves Christians who are convinced they're on the way to heaven are not going to go to heaven even though they're not involved in a lot of bad things. Now that seems like a paradox, but you'll see what I mean as it unfolds in the truth of this morning. I'm referring to those who probably have never or do not use drugs or alcohol. They're not involved or indulging in pornography or gambling or perversion. They're not numbered among the wicked or the vile. In fact, you probably find most of these people are referred to in church on Sunday morning, anywhere in the country. You'll find them as family people, family values. You'll see them with friends. You'll see them enjoying the good things of life. But having said that, let me make a very bold statement, and some of you may be offended by it. But I want to make it here before I start, and I want you to listen very closely. I say it out of loving concern for the body of Jesus Christ. Some of you who are convinced you're going to heaven are going to be shut out 
and you may be in danger of losing your soul. Even though you sit in this church this morning absolutely convinced that you are on your way to heaven. If you've ever listened to a message in your life, listen to what the Holy Spirit says this morning. Very, very vital to your very salvation. Some are going to be shut out not because of the bad things they've done, but because they've become so preoccupied with doing good, legitimate things, they have pushed the things of God aside. So involved in doing good, legitimate things that they have literally had no time for the deeper spiritual things of the Spirit. They're so interested in the here and now, they have pushed out of their mind the hereafter. They're not knowingly rejecting the Lord, but they've simply neglected. It's not adultery, it's not fornication, it's none of these things that we totem pole as, as vile, gross sins. They're honest, sincere, hard-working people, but their focus has been damaged. Their focus is completely out of order. The Word says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, these are the words of Jesus, and they're not a suggestion. They're a commandment. The Lord means what He says. You seek first the kingdom of God, I'll take care of your career, I'll take care of your business, I'll take care of your home life, I'll take care of everything, if you will put me first in your focus. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Again, that's not a suggestion, that's a commandment. Set your affections like iron, like concrete, set your affections on the things of God. And in the Greek it says, it means set your focus or your interest on the things of the Lord, things above. Set it. Immovable. Intractable. You cannot change because you have set it in concrete. Now, God has never demanded that anyone who follows Him now, to sell their houses, their land, their business, and become a monk and go meditate and study the Bible all day. God never said that. He said that to one man, and he said that to one man because that was his idol. He does not say it to everybody. He's not telling you to forsake your family. He's not telling you. We have many people come, married people, many wives come and say, God told me to leave my wife, my, hu my husband, my children, to go into the ministry. And I look him right in and I say, no, God didn't tell you that. Your own mind told you that or the devil. God's not in the business of breaking up marriages. No, God's not asking you to, to, to go out and do something uh, like that at all. But God does insist, in fact, He demands in being the center of your life around which everything else revolves. He alone has to be the center of everything you say and everything you do. Everything else has to revolve around that interest. It has to be central. The greatest indignity against the Lord is for Christians to put Him in a secondary place, to slap in God's face. You say you're not guilty of that kind of an affront to the Lord, then how do you prior prioritize your time? What takes the priority? What about all the nights you've missed going to church? Because you put your job, your business, your career first. No, your clients didn't wait. God waited. Now, I'm not talking about people, nurses and, and uh, day jobs where, where your job requires that you work doing a church night service. No, because you have no choice. I'm talking about those who have a choice. Those in career and those in business and those who have jobs where they have a choice and we're not out working in the hours when God's people meet. The Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some are doing in the last days. Don't forsake yourself, the, the assembling of the saints. That's the commandment of the Lord. But what takes priority? Your business? Your job? Your career? Who does the waiting? Is it God who's waiting in the assembly to meet with you? And the, what the scripture is actually saying to you, if, if you would put my house, my interest first, 
I'll take care of all of that. And that which you thought had to be done now can be done at a later date, at a better time, and God would make it successful. God would take care of it. Now let me take you into God's Word and show you the awful consequences of being so preoccupied with good, legitimate things that the things of God, the interest of the Lord, the eternal purposes of God are put secondary. They are not the priority of the life. And let me show you the awful consequences. In fact, I didn't know the Lord had said so much about it in His Word. And when I saw it, I thought, we had better listen. And I'm hearing it. I hear it in my spirit, and I want you to hear it this morning. Let's consider, first of all, what Jesus said about the days of Noah and Lot. I want you to go to Luke 17, please. Now, folks, it's going to get very hot here in just a few moments. I hope you love the Word. Luke 17. Let's begin reading verse 26. Luke 17, beginning to read verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven that destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. Let's stop right there. Now, folks, I want you to look again at this list that Jesus, these are red letters and these are the words of Jesus himself. I want you to look at the list of the things they were doing both in the time of Noah and in Sodom and Gomorrah. What were they doing? We know there were, these were times of violence violence such as the world had never seen. There was gross immorality, but the Lord is not talking about homosexuality here. He's not talking about alcoholism. He's not talking about perversion. He's not talking about abortions. What does he say that they were doing? They did eat. They drank. That's not talking about drunkenness. They were just eating and drinking liquids. They married. They were being espoused or engaged. They bought. They sold. They planted. They built it. There's not a sin on that list. These are all good things. These are all things that God considers uh, a faithful, righteous person would do if they're going to be providers for their family. All of these things are recommended in the Scripture to those who are faithful to their families and to God. Those who are legitimately uh, people who are working, uh, individuals. Paul said marriage is no sin. God said marriage is honorable. In Proverbs 31, it says that a virtuous wife considers a field, she buys it, she plants a vineyard, she works diligently with her hands. And as far as building is concerned, ever since the time of Joshua, when they went into the pro promised land, God moved on men to build many, many edifices and buildings for his glory. There's nothing wrong with anything that's mentioned. These are good things. These are legitimate things. Why did Jesus focus on the good, legitimate things they did in that day, both in Noah's day and Sodom's day? Folks, he's trying to say something to us. It was their total inattention to his word while being so absorbed in their own selfish interest. There's not a word said that Noah, in his 120 years of building the ark, was ever abused. There's not a word there that even he was mocked. There's not a word there that anyone stopped him in the construction of that ark. He, he worked unabated. No one bothered him the whole time that he's in construction of the... Of the he, he was able to preach. No one stopped his message. But you see, in Noah's day, everybody was so busy marrying getting engaged, going to uh, eating places, and mixing with their friends, and having pleasure, and so involved in life, they had no time for Noah's message. That's what the Lord is saying. They were so wrapped up in good, legitimate things. Boy, you talk about pinning the American lifestyle. It's not that, you know, I can go anywhere in the United States, I can write books and I can prophesy about the coming of the Lord and coming judgments. 
But you know, outside of a few in the remnant who accept it and believe it, the masses here, they don't listen, they don't care. Why? Because they, they are busy, they've got plans, they're doing things. They're all wrapped up in their marriages and in their homes and in their businesses and making money. They have no time for any message of the coming judgment of the Lord. Noah's message got lost in a hustle of busyness. So shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. And the Lord is saying in the last generation is going to be the same way. They're going to be so busy, so wrapped up in their families, so wrapped up in their jobs and their careers. They are going to put my message, my interest aside. John 2, 31, 32. Wherefore, say my people, we will come to you no more. My people have forgotten me days without number. Yet they say, I am innocent. Behold, I will plead with thee because you say, I have not sinned. And folks, that's the way it is now. There are many who think they're on the way to heaven, convinced they are. They don't open their Bible week after week. The Bible lays on the shelf. The only word they get is in the house of God. They're not seeking the face of God diligently. They're not locked in some little room. They're not locked in a bedroom. They're not when everybody's gone. They don't prioritize their time and say, Lord, I'm going to give you time. They're not seekers after God. They're good people. They're moral people. They're family people with family values, doing good things, legitimate things. But the Lord is not first. The Lord is not everything. He's not the center of their life. If He were the center of their, if your life, if He is the center of your life, you will find time with Him. You will love His Word. He will be everything to you. You'll not put Him aside. You'll not take second place. The prophet chided them in this, in Jeremiah for gadding about. You'll find that Jeremiah 2, 3. He said, my people gad about, running around, doing good things, busy doing legitimate works, even religious things, but n neglecting the Word of God, not time to seek God. You know, you can be so busy running around for God, you can't seek Him. You can't sit and listen because you're running, 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 getting about. There are some churches that keep their busy, their people so preoccupied, so busy. I've heard people in certain churches tell me, Brother Dave, I have no time with my family. I have no time to pray, no time to seek God. We promised God we'd never do that in this church. Keep you running so much that you have no time to spend with Him or your family. So shall it be when the Son of Man comes. He said, that's the way it's going to be. He, and why, why isn't he say, when, when I come, why didn't he talk about our crime rate? Why didn't he talk about abortion? Why didn't he talk about uh, pushing him out of our schools? Why didn't he talk about the gross immorality of America and the violence? Why didn't he say, he said, it's going to be just like it was eating Selling, buying, planting, busy. He didn't even name any of our sins. He named only the good, legitimate things. There are a number of people that used to attend this church. I, in my mind, I see their faces. I know their names. This, this church is going to celebrate, I think it, it's... Uh, and, and we begin our ninth year, isn't it, in September or October? And this is probably the first three years. There was such an excitement. There were people, business people, a lot of career people, and those who hold day jobs, just ordinary loving people, and they were so excited. They never missed a service. They would not only sit and listen, they would buy every tape and go home and listen to it again so they'd get it. They would, they, every time they went out, they went out loaded down with tapes and were passing them everywhere. They told us time and time again, they would put their arms around me and say, Brother Dave, I was starving and this church has saved my life 
And they were so excited about Jesus, they never missed. They were on fire. The church of Jesus Christ came first, the things of God first. They were praying, they were seeking God. They are not here. They are gone. It used to be when I would see them on the street, or I would go into their business, they would call me. You should have seen, I would walk in, the secretary, I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Wilkes. Oh, go right in. And I would go in, they would drop everything and hug me and say, Pastor, Sunday was marvelous. Oh, I went home and I could hardly sleep. The Spirit of the Lord was upon me all night. They would see me on the street, they would come running and hug me, and even turn around to strangers with a big beam. This is my pastor, we're from Thomas Park Church, you need to come. They were wrapped up in their business. Little by little I saw them backslide. They're no longer here. Oh, they still love the Lord, they, they pray at times, but they're going to a church now, they get a one hour service and a twenty little minute message with no conviction. And when I see them on the street now, they pretend they don't see me and run. And I want you to know that hurts. I feel the rejection. What do you think God feels? What do you think God feels by those who once knew Him and walked with Him and cried with Him? And now they're all wrapped up. They said, Lord, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. You've saved my life from a godless hell. And the very fact that they don't want to talk to me anymore is proof they're not talking to God anymore. And he is before all things, speaking of Jesus, he's the head of the body, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that preeminence is another word for first place. Now let's consider the man who made a great feast, whose invited guest turned him down. Go to Luke 14, just turn left. Luke 14. Now this parable is very important because Jesus gave it, and more than that, he's the man who gave the feast. This is all about Jesus. 14, verse 16, beginning to read. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, showed his Lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. The servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, folks, this is serious, serious business. That feast is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that table was spread at the cross. That's the invitation of Jesus himself, said, come unto me. It's an invitation to intimacy. It's an intimate invitation for all of us. It's not just for few. He, he bade many. He invited you to come. The table is spread. You can come and find full satisfaction in me. You can find everything you need to satisfy any hunger in your life. All things having to do with holiness and godliness, all wrapped up in Christ Jesus feasting on him in his presence, we supping with him, he's supping with us. That's the invitation, that's the feast. And at supper time, everything was ready, and those who were invited didn't show up. There was nobody there, the table was spread, and nobody had showed up, and nobody was coming down the road. Sister, how would you feel? You, you cooked this wonderful meal, you've invited guests, they said they would come. 
it's a seven o'clock meal and you, you decide to set the table and you have everything on the stove just on simmer and nobody shows up and then you send somebody out or you get on the phone and call and say where are you well, well I'm sorry they didn't even call you didn't give you any notice but they just don't come wouldn't you take that as total rejection wouldn't you take that as being not interested in anything you do not interested in your feast not interested whatsoever I want you to look at this this is this is the Lord's invitation. come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden I'll give you rest he said all things are now ready do you understand, folks, that Jesus has done everything already? He doesn't have to do anything else to give us full satisfaction in this life. He doesn't have to add anything. It's all there. The table's been spread. Everything's been ready. According as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. They all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Now, the first excuse <clears throat> excused himself because he was preoccupied with a real estate deal. He said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I have to go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, he had to be a speculator. Only a speculator would buy land without seeing it. It could have been swamp land. And by the way, that land wasn't going anywhere. He didn't have to go right then. He could have gone tomorrow. But you see, he's so wrapped up. Now, he could have been a builder, a place to build some buildings. I don't know. It may have been a plot of land to build a house for his family. I don't know. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. The point is, it's a good, legitimate thing. The excuse is not sinful. If you bought land today and Jesus comes tonight, you didn't sin. He said, occupy till I come. That's not the point. The point is that this man had the wrong focus. He focused on his land, he focused on his business, he focused on building and buying. He, he put the invitation for intimacy with the Lord aside. He says, I'll take care of that later, I'm going to take care of my business first. You take care of your business first, and I want to tell you something, the Bible says the master was angry. And he said, that man is not coming. He will never enter my doors. He's not going in. Now, folks, that's serious business. Just before judgment fell on Judah, remember Elijah bought a piece of land from one of his relatives. So I'm telling you, that's not the sin. The second one speculated in cattle. He said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them or test them. Now, I don't know if he bought them at an auction. That's a lot of cattle. That's, that's ten, ten ox. And he buys them. He probably saw them. They look good, but now he's going to go prove them. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Job and Abraham could probably tell him a lot about oxen. They were rich in cattle. That's not a sin. Folks, I hope you're getting the point. Everywhere God speaks about when he comes, what it's going to be like when he comes. He's saying these people are doing good, legitimate things, but it's taking their mind, it's consuming them. And they're putting me aside. They're excusing themselves. Is it to say, well, I still love him? That's okay. He understands. I've got a, I've got a family to feed. I've got things to do. No. God will not, under any circumstances, take second place. He won't. He said, I'm telling you, I love you, and if you put me first, if, if my work comes first, I'll take care of these things. You'll not go down. You'll not go under. Mm. Isn't it strange that some people find it more important to go to the barn than to go to the house of God that's what he did he went to the barn test his oxen the last one says I have married a wife therefore I cannot come now nothing could be more legitimate than getting married 
that's a good thing. In fact, marriage is honorable, the Bible says. Honorable. He that finds a good wife finds a good thing, the Scripture says. It's a good thing. You see, that's not the issue. The Lord says everything they do is fine in its time and its place. But not in my place. Not in my place. And that's the sin. You see... He, he should have told his wife. He should have started his marriage on the right foot. He should have said, now, dear, I'll tell you something. The Lord has always been first in my life. Nothing takes the place of my Lord. I go to church. I, I seek the face of God. And when those doors are open, honey, I'm going to be there. And I want, I want my values to be your values. I want you to walk with me. He should have taken her. She'd have had a great time. What woman doesn't have a good time to get dressed up and go to a feast? But you see, he put family first. This is one of the great sins in the church today. I, I see housewives who, who, who find it hard to come to church on Sunday morning, let alone any other night. But they have time to get about all day for their kids, music classes, dancing classes, all kinds of classes, picnics, sports, Shopping? I folks, the list could go on and on and on. My kids come first. Let me tell you something. I'm subconscious about it now. Put your children first, and you're going to damn them. That's what happened to Hezekiah. He got 15 extra years that should have been spent on his face before God and renewing the land. And he spent his last 15 years playing with adult toys, with jewels and cattle and building buildings. And he raised a son during the time named Manasseh, who watched his dad put him and his toys first. And he became one of the most wicked kings in the history of Israel. Who's first in your life? Your family? Do you let your husband or your wife dictate how you're going to follow the Lord? Do you stay away from God's house because your wife or your husband says, stay home with me tonight? Let me make another strong statement, and I want you to hear this. If you don't get anything else out of my message, hear this clear. You are not truly a lover of Jesus if you're not protective of your time spent with him. It has to come to the place where everything else is considered an intrusion into your time. If you, if you don't have a certain time given to the Lord, if you don't have that special time and you protect that time and you will not let anybody anything intrude folks I hope I'm at that place where when I go into the prayer closet I tell my family I don't care who calls if the president called I'm busy a chance of his calling me By the way, I'd sooner get a call from any of you. Not that I don't pray for the president. I pray every day. But see, once you put off the Lord, once you put other things in his place, it gets easier and easier to put him off. Till finally, you neglect him, as the scripture said, days without number. Jesus said, I say unto you that none of these men which were invited shall taste of my supper. He said, all right, so gentlemen, you're so busy. You push me aside. I'm no longer first in your life. You put your family and your donkeys and your oxen and 
and your lands and possessions ahead of me, you don't want to come and sup with me and get to know me, then I'm telling you, you're not going to enter my gates. There are going to be many say, we did mighty works, we cast out devils, we healed the sick. Mighty good, those are all good things, but it damned, they were still damned in the end. All these good things that they did. Because Lord said, I don't know you. I don't know you. Finally, a large number who ought to be in the bridal procession are going to be left out. They're not going to be in the bridal procession in the last day. Now, it's a powerful parable given to us in Matthew 25. Will you turn left again to Matthew 25, quickly? This is about the virgins, the ten virgins. You know this quite well. I'm going to be finished here in ten minutes, but I want you to get this. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. All those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I send you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now look at me, please. Folks, this is very powerful since the bridal party represents the church. I don't know if Bible statistics are true. Could it be that half of those who think they're in the bridehood of Christ are not going to make it? This is an awful, awful picture here. And by the way, folks, I have no trouble with them slumbering, sleeping up to midnight. First place, that's not the heart of the story. In second place, and listen closely, the, the, those who had oil, they could sleep in peace because because they had enough to see them through to the morning. They had what it takes. But folks, we get so focused on the oil, we don't see something I want to show you here. Very important. We know that their lamps went out because of a lack of oil. Some people call that the Holy Spirit, that, that they have lost the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They have been walking carelessly. All of that, that may be. But once they did replenish the oil, the five wise virgins are already in. The bride, bridal party is already in and the doors are closed. They go get their supply of oil and they come back. The five foolish virgins are knocking at the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. What did the bridegroom say? He didn't ask, where have you been? He didn't say, you didn't, he didn't miss any of their sins. He didn't talk about their being late. He didn't say anything like that. What did he say? He said, I don't know you. I don't know you. That's the heart of this story. I had a, last Sunday, I had a lady and her daughter backstage. And they stood there smiling at me, shook hands, and just stood there smiling. They said, you don't recognize us? I said, no. We met you 15 years ago in, in Los Angeles at a crusade. You prayed for us. We're on your manning list. We love your messages. We pray for you every day. Don't you recognize us? I said, I'm sorry. I don't. I haven't seen you in 15 years. <laughs> you see the disappointment on their face. I get that all the time. Almost once or twice a month, somebody comes from around the country. I babysat with you when your parents went on vacation. I haven't seen them in years. <laughs> now, we know God's omniscient. He knows everything. It's not a fact that he doesn't know them. You know what the Lord is saying? You've never taken me serious. You've never put me first. 
That's not what my bridehood's about. I can't recognize that spirit. I can't recognize your kind of walk. That's not what this is about. I'm sorry, you're not a part of this. You're part of another world. I don't recognize that. I won't accept that, is exactly what it is. I won't accept that. Folks, I don't want to stand on that day. I don't want to stand on that day as a stranger. Do you know him in a secret closet? Not here in church and worship. Do you know him in a secret closet? Is is when 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 you're sitting uh, on the subway going to work, do you shut yourself in and are you knowing him? Are you talking to him? When the house of God is open, are you here as often as you can, other than being too sick to come? And then ask God to heal you? And he'll give you the power to come anyhow. You, you say, are you trying to pack the church? Folks, this church couldn't be any more packed. Look, people standing everywhere. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your eternal salvation and putting the things of God first. Now, folks, I'm going to close in just a minute. But I want to tell you, you know, you take a walk in the streets of New York at night. And it's a heartbreaking experience. Like last night for me. Just to go out to get a newspaper. It's only two blocks. And on 49th Street, a bag woman sitting in a door stoop. She couldn't be more than in her mid-50s. But she looks like she's in her 80s or 90s. And she's got her little bag. And I look at her, she, her, her eyes met mine. It was that lost look as if to say, this is all that life has offered me. And I'm thinking, that was that's somebody's mother. That's somebody's mother. And your gut turns. And then you go to 8th Avenue and turn right, and you see a man in his early 30s probably, but he looks like he's in his 60s, and he's on drugs, and he's stoned. And he's muttering some foolishness that he doesn't understand or anybody else understands. And you say, oh God, he lives in hell. He's going to die and go to a fiery hell. I said, that doesn't seem right to me that somebody lives in hell and then dies and goes to hell. And then you put it by a newspaper and while you're turning around, you see a young prostitute and her eyes meet yours and you see a lostness and you wonder in your heart, has she ever known what it's like to be normal? You see her diseased body broken and still trying to sell it to get another fix. And you start crying and you walk into your apartment and close the door and go into the study and sit on your chair and just stare in space and say, Oh, God, didn't you say that Chorazin and Bethsaida would have more mercy than Sodom and Gomorrah? Because in Sodom they didn't hear, they didn't have a Bible, they didn't have the Word. And I think of all of these people on the streets, all these derelicts, and I say, God, they've not heard the sermons that the people here at Times Square Church. They don't know how, even if they heard it, they don't know how to process it. Their minds are shut. But, oh God, I think sometimes in my heart, you're going to have more mercy. You're going to have more compassion on all the derelicts and the homeless alcoholics that walk this street without a brain left. And all the saints of God who have heard hundreds and hundreds of sermons and turned their back, gone their way, backslidden in heart, putting the Lord off. Amen. Where is he in your life? I'm telling you now, if he's not the apple of your eye, 
If you're not focused on Him, that includes His church, His word, prayer, His interest. You can't be His disciple. Better to be a derelict than a hypocrite. Let me tell you why I preach like this. Because I know how soon I have to be before Him. Just my age. And listen to me. I, I'm going to answer to God not for being one of His instruments to raise up this church and be a testimony to New York City. I have to answer for you. Everyone who calls this your home, I have to answer to God. God help me if I didn't deliver you the whole counsel of God. And even to prick you even to bring the hammer down and crush your self-interest and bring you back to where you belong. I'm going to say it again, straight and clear. And I say it out of love. A number of you that are hearing this message now, unless you make a commitment now, Lord, from this morning on, I commit to you that you are going to be the center and everything else is going to take second place. Your church, your interest, your word, my family, everything. Second place. You're everything, Jesus, from this day on. And if not, if not, everything else is in vain. Will you stand? Heavenly Father, only you know the hearts of those I minister to today. In the balcony, in the main floor, those who are standing, those in the lower rotunda, and those backstage, all around, wherever they may be in this house. Lord Jesus, I've delivered my soul. And now, Lord, it's up to you, Holy Spirit. It's up to you, Holy Spirit, to make this word life. Oh, God. Don't let anybody that calls themselves your friend, your child, ever to reject you and put you pigeonholed somewhere secondary. God, bring us back. Bring us to this place. I'm placing you first. Now, here's my invitation. First of all, for those in this building, you have to admit, Pastor David, I tell you the truth. I've been so busy. I've grown cold. I've really grown cold in my spirit. I want you to come first. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. Come with these that are coming. You may not even know him. Come now. From the balcony, you go to the stairs on either end, on either side, and come down any aisle. Now, be honest before the Lord. Pastor David, folks, this is serious business before the Holy Ghost. I've been so busy. I've been so wrapped. I've not taken the time to seek God. I've not taken time with His Word. I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit this morning. The Holy Ghost is convicted. You come. This is the first invitation. That's it. Second invitation is not for the, for those who are going to get in an hour, come down. There's no room, but when you're right where you stand in your seat, if you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit and there's been that sharp knife, that's God speaking. 
That's God saying, this is for you. Apply it now. Change. Make the change. You that have come forward, look at me, please. I want to tell you something. As just as strong as he is in his warnings, so loving is he when you receive it. He's not going to, he doesn't go and say, uh, rebuke and say, now, uh, why did you do it? And where did you go? And why did you get so cold toward me? And why did you drift? No questions. He's saying, the table is spread, now come. Come back where you left. Come to the point of departure and renew now. This is a time for renewal, right now. Listen to me, please. It's not that God wants a river of tears from you. He doesn't want any promises from you. What he wants is you to promise yourself. You've got to make a commitment for yourself. You've got to give him a mind now and say, I am going to commit right now. God, help me by your Holy Spirit to keep this commitment. Because you can't do it in yourself. We all have a tendency to slip back into our lazy ways. That's why even as a minister of the gospel, I have to stay close to him and in this word, in this word. But folks, you that are standing here now, God wants to do something very special for you. He wants to nail this thing down. He wants to nail it down. You wouldn't have come forward unless the Spirit of God was on you. You wouldn't have come forward unless something in your heart says, this is what I want. I want the Lord Jesus from now till I die, or till Jesus comes, to be the center of my life and my home. How many want that? Raise your hand, please. Keep it raised there for just a moment. And pray with me this prayer right now. Jesus, forgive me for being self-centered. I'm sorry. I don't want it that way. I want you to be everything. I make a commitment to you, Lord. By your grace and mercy, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, from this day on, to keep you first in my life. Help my focus, Lord. Keep it on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, will you thank him in your own words, Lord? I thank you for dealing with me this morning, for calling me back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, look at me. What a wonderful thing when you just come with a willing, open heart and say, Lord, that's me. I'm, that's me. I'm sorry. The Lord sees that. And oh, he'll move quickly. You know what happened? Then, then the Holy Spirit will bring this word back to your mind and replay it. And he'll keep loving you, keep convicting you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us of sin. But you've got to make up your mind right now. See, you've, you've got to stay in this book. Have the time. Have a place. Let me tell you, if you have a quiet time with the Lord every day, even when you get up or before you go to bed, sometime in the day, you've got to have a half hour at least there where it's just you and the Lord alone and you're talking heart to heart with Him and then into His Word. Go through the Psalms. Have that. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to, you're not going to put Him aside. You will not put him away. He will, he will be there. That's why it's good to start today that way. And say, when you get up in the morning, first thing you say, Lord, I'm focused on you. You're my Lord. And help me today to put you first in everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First, Lord, in everything. Now, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing by your spirit in this congregation. All through this house. Lord, you've convicted me in my preaching. I hope you've convicted every one of us. Lord, that we would, we would never, ever have time for everything, but not time for you. God, it doesn't mean we're going to put aside these good things. These are good things, legitimate things. We need to continue providing for our families and building and planting and selling. Those are good things, Lord Jesus. But Lord, help us to put them in their place. Nothing before you from this day on. Nothing before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. These five people say, God is good. God is good. He is. He's good. God is good. God is good. 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 good.